Thank you very much. Sorry I'm wearing my coat, but I think really cold um, yesterday and today. I'm not hiding anything underneath. It's just that I'm a bit cold. So apologies for that. Um, this presentation, uh, I gave a similar presentation at the M25 uh, meeting, and some of you were there, so apologies for that. I'm going to emphasize the learning design more, so you, you're going to uh, have a look at the framework in more detail, so, so you know, and you don't leave the room now. Uh, but, um, so I'm Maria Torotroconis. Um, I actually work at uh, Cambridge Education Group Digital. And my colleague, Anthony Alexiev, he's not here today, unfortunately, but he's from Queen Mary University. Um, we at uh, CEG Digital, we partner with different universities to develop our online programs, fully online programs, and these are some of uh, our partners. And that's why I'm presenting this paper with uh, Queen Mary today, because he, uh, they are one of our partners, and um, we tend to create also research collaborations with, with different people within those institutions. Um, but today, really, um, when we think there are two themes to this paper, learning analytics as well as learning design, and I really want to emphasize the learning design aspect of that, because as we, we've been hearing uh, today and yesterday, uh, the context of learning analytics is really important, and I think if we emphasize where we are coming from, from the learning design point of view, we will be able to understand better where we are going with the learning analytics. So that's why today I'm going to uh, deep, uh, go deeper into the learning design framework that we, that we work on. Um, so the learning design framework that we are following is based on the co-design framework that we, uh, we developed at Liverpool University. Um, this framework is open source, it's, I'll give you a website later, but it's being designed for CEG Digital and that's what we are using now with the partners. Um, the co-design framework uh, feeds from the blended learning design framework that we developed at Imperial College, this is a few years ago now. Uh, at the time we partnered with City University, with um, UCL and King's College and we pilot the, the, the use of the tool. Uh, but I want to tell you today what we are taking from that framework into the new co-design framework. Um, and it's basically, as you can see there on the right-hand side, when we designed the framework, we were thinking about how, how do we do blended learning? How do we know how much, how, what activities lend themselves to self-directed learning? And what activities lend themselves to collaborative learning? And that was a big question at the time. So we, as you can see on the right hand side, that graph is showing uh, when we mapped the learning outcomes, we can see where you fit within the, the graph. So you see the x-axis is showing you the instructionist approach, the self-directed approach, and the y-axis is showing the collaborative approach. So you can see where the blend goes. And the self-directed learning can be face-to-face, -face, it can be online, it can be a mix. The key components are uh, self-directed, uh, something that you do on your own, uh, in any kind of mode, and the collaborative aspect can be also face-to-face -face, uh, or online. So, but the key really for us to identify that blend was um, the use of learning outcomes, because at the end of the day you need to know what you want your learners to be able to do uh, in your activities. So, that's why we use Bloom's taxonomy. So, basically, the, at the end of the research, what we established was uh, activities that lend themselves to self-directed learning, for example, in the psychomotor domain, to develop skills, you need a mix of both. You can't rely on uh, medical surgeons to be doing just online learning and then being able to operate and, and perform in the, in the theatre. Uh, the cognitive domain, uh, if you are within the low end of the cognitive domain, you can use self-directed learning. So if you, if you need factual information, procedural information, you can use self-directed learning. But if you move up the level in the cognitive domain, if you look at conceptual and metacognitive, you need to have collaboration. You need to give a space to students to verbalize what they are learning and being able to explain what they are uh, constructing. Uh, and the affective domain, again, changing people's behaviors and attitudes. We can't just rely on a self-directed learning, a self-directed module to be able to do that. Um, sometimes you can see that in the corporate sector, for example, with uh, changing people's attitude to diversity, and you just sit down and click, 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 and then you've done that, and you've changed your perception of diversity and health and safety. 
So that's why we uh, say the effective domain, we, have, we need to have um, a collaborative activity. So this is what we're taking from, from the blended learning framework. And it's basically how we accommodate the, the, the driver for the learning design, depending on what you, where you are within the cognitive and the effective and the psychomotor. Um, and also within the co-design framework, we are using two frameworks, which is the Lailard framework, the learning types. And uh, you can see that, for example, acquisition, one of the learning types is when you're reading or you're consuming some content, listening to a podcast, watching a video clip. A discussion, when you are obviously discussing with your peers, with your tutor. A practice, when you're putting into practice what you're learning. Production, when you are producing something tangible, probably a digital artifact or something, or something in, the, in, the, in, the, in a tutorial or something like that. Inquiry, when you're looking for information, uh, where you might be searching on the internet, looking information in the library. And here, there is another learning type that we don't mention there, which is the collaboration, because we embed that in the production uh, side of things. That's why it's not listed there. Um, the other framework that we use is basically, so we say, okay, we know that coming from the, from Bloom Taxonomy, we know where we are. We, our, my learning outcome is telling me that my learners need to be able to explain something, and that means conceptual level within the cognitive domain. Uh, now, I'm going to use a mix of things. I'm going to use a bit of acquisition, a bit of discussion. I want them to practice, and so on. Uh, but how much of that do I put together? That's why we are using the 70-20-10. So basically, the 70-20-10 is telling us a little bit about how we can balance the learning activity. Now that we know where we are coming from, what we are trying to achieve from a learning outcome point of view, we know what kind of types, uh, types of learning we can use within that to, uh, to deliver that learning outcome, how much of that can we put together? So we use the 70-20-10. It's not set on stone. It's something just to guide us on, on how we see the week. So if we are designing a week, how the balance is going. And this is something that Leonard is there. He created these six steps uh, at the beginning of the, of the company where we have, at the beginning of every week, so if uh, we are developing a 30 credit module, we have 12 weeks, every week we'll have these boxes, these sections. And uh, the first section is basically the introduction of the topic, and we call it hook and discussion. That's when we link practice with the topic to engage the, the, the learners. Guided practice is more the lecture material. Uh, challenge activity, uh, something to produce, something to, to practice on. Uh, reflection and webinar. The webinar is a face-to-face, -face, well, it's an online uh, live uh, activity with a tutor. So you can see, if we go back to the 70-20-10, the 10%, the acquisition, is mainly going on number two, on guided practice. Although it might go somewhere else, you know, if there, are there is a reading in the challenge activity and so on. So the 20 and the 70 are spread around the other sections. But that's helping us. So if we are designing that week, we can see, wow, that week has, the 10% the has gone up to 50. And if we apply this to probably to our traditional delivery in, in higher education at the moment, we can see probably the 10% very, very high. And that's, I think, that's the challenge for us to really challenge that approach and introduce more collaborative learning. But this is basically how we, we balance the learning activities. So this is the framework, and all of these frameworks are basically uh, included in the co-design framework. And this is how we are um, basically navigating the learning design uh, aspect of, of the project. So uh, the cards, basically, this is these printed cards that we have and we share with academics. And you can see on the left-hand side, those are six phases that we have. And on the right-hand side is two piles of cars, one green and one blue. And I'm going to show you now the faces, uh, the six faces on the left-hand side. So phase one, basically, when we sit down, we talk about the scope of the project. So if we are designing a module, we talk about the main learning outcomes, what they want to achieve. Are there any um, problems in terms of uh, capabilities, the, uh, digital skills, you know, these kind of things uh, in terms of the, the target users? Uh, Phase two is, is really key, and this is the one that links to blended, to the blended learning framework. And here is when we then go down to learning outcomes, and we, we need to specify what they, they need to be able to, to do. 
And then you have verbs in the blue and the green boxes, and that's how you identify the activities in the blue and the green, and the green cards. Activity descriptors, different things uh, I'll show you later. I don't have much time now. Learning descriptors, the learning types, as well as the, uh, it, says it has to be updated, it's advanced AGE framework. Um, then the, you select all your learning activities, and then you ana analyze the learning applying the 70 20 10. So as you can see here, we, this, this is one of the cards, the blue cards. So that means that when you went through the phases, you've identified the verb within that box. And that means high level cognitive domain, probably or the affective domain. And this is an example. So we have different examples from different partners. In this case, this one is from Falmouth University and it's for inquiring, producing, practicing and discussing. And it's contextualizing what we are saying with the framework. You can see there, um, the, the different components of the activities that I mentioned, the 70-20-10 with the learning type, so you know what you're targeting using that type of activity. You can see here that it's an online activity, individual and group work, and also you need a VLE to deliver that. And these are the advanced HE domains. So you, if you're applying for the fellowship, you know that, uh, how you map that activity, uh, I mean, as a, as a teacher uh, in your practice. Uh, this is another example from Queen Mary, and also producing all the different components. But I think, I mean, it's nearly over the presentation, but now it's going to the learning analytics. So knowing, uh, having a systematic way of designing uh, the courses is easier for us to actually think about how we're going to interrogate the data, how we're going to do learning analytics to help and to inform our learning design. And this is what we are doing with Queen Mary. So we had, this is a very small project, a very small sample, only 22 students uh, and two assignments on that module. We had over 4,000 entries, 4,000 entries that we analyzed. Um, and we applied a log uh, logistic regression analysis. Um, our dependent variable was a pass mark over 60%. So we were looking at if there was any association between the, the participation in forums or the, the, the entries in the reflective portfolio, because that's happening every week, uh, or there was any association with access to content pages with the overall uh, PASMA or the overall performance in the course. And we were thinking that probably people that participated more were doing better, but we didn't find any significant difference in that area. Whereas we found um, a significant difference, not too, the p-value is not too low, but is still significant in the use of the re clinical reflective journal. So we identify for a student having six entries in their critical reflective journal, the probability of passing the module with a, or a mark over 60% is about 80%. Um, obviously, you know, it depends on all the variables. You know, this is just a very small uh, analysis that we did. We need to look at a bigger sample, more data, and uh, cross-check all the variables as well. But it's just interesting. I think it's just for us to see, I think the main, my goal today is really to show you that for us to really do some learning analytics, we really need to contextualize what we are doing. We need to, in terms of learning design, if we are doing learning design systematically um, without losing track of how pedagogically we are doing it, uh, we can then think about how learning design can help us and um, help the learners to, to achieve their, their outcomes. Uh, and that's thing, that's me. Thank you very much. That's my contact details and the website. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, there's no questions on the Me Too at the moment. Do we have any questions in the room? Anyone going to ask a question? Yep, over there. Hi, thanks for your talk. I was really um, inspired by the last uh, finding that reflective journals and seemed to have this correlation to enhance in the grade. Um, but of course, is there any way we could determine if those students were going to be more likely to succeed anyway? That their fact of doing reflections was related to the fact that they were already good students and it was not the journals or their engagement with the online platform that made the difference. How can we disambiguate those findings? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, that's why we need to be doing a bigger analysis. And also, uh, we need to be careful about also the data that we are using in terms of demographics and things like that. But I think that's a really important point. I mean, we can't generalize with the findings that 
you know, anybody that will be more active reflecting would do, will, you know, pass the course with high, high pass mark. Uh, but that's why this is just the beginning of the research, and this, that's something that we are thinking about as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A question just up there. Uh, thank you, Maria. Very interesting talk. Um, I'm really interested in the way you have used the 70 20 10 model, model because we are doing the same at the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Uh, but of course, there is a bit of discussion about the fact that the 70 20 10 model is not really supported by evidence or data. So are you going to publish any research on the way we should use the model to you know, start collecting uh, evidence about it? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, what we want to see really is, um, I mean, when we are designing the courses, really, the 70-20-10 is never spot on. Uh, so we can see, for example, courses on, on law, uh, the 10 becomes higher because of the nature of the course. Uh, so what we are really interested in is really to look at how the foundation of the 70-20-10 is there, but is how the disciplines, how that's, that variation is happening and why. And I think rather than just saying, yeah, the 70-20-10 works, I don't think we, in, in teaching and learning, we can really apply that formula to anything. I think that's just the, the foundation for us to give us guidance and then to, to have a more constructive analysis of, of, you know, of the data that we can collate. But yeah, hopefully we will be publishing something along the, those lines. Thank you. Um, I know we are now pretty much just a little bit over time and we've got a fairly tight bump out to the next session. So I'd like you to thank all three of our presenters and also Maria who hasn't had her own individual applause. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, off to your next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Maria. I'm John Wilson, I'm the CEO at Agenta. We're a technology company that focuses on education and learning. We build, manage and operate platforms for education, for video collaboration. Externally, we prefer to work with what we feel as ethical industries. Um, obviously education, teaching, learning, healthcare. We feel that we can really contribute to these industries by creating exciting platforms, um, easy to use platforms, secure platforms that people can utilise. What we feel is one of the most important things for Scotland to boost economic growth uh, is investing in rural areas. By investing in uh, broadband in these local areas, we can attract more talent, we can attract more companies, and we can drastically improve the delivery of education and learning within these schools within disparate regions within Scotland.